Good afternoon. Afternoon, buenas tardes. Konnichiwa. Uh, I'm Anthea Hartig. I have uh, I have notes that are misbehaving. Um, I am uh, honored to be the Elizabeth McMillan Director of the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian Institution. And I am more, probably even more proud to be a third generation um, Southern California girl. And last night, uh, very humbly and with um, uh, with excitement, I became the president of the Organization of American Historians. So as uh, as an historian, as an historian and a public servant, it's a humbling honor to assume the presidency of an organization that has meant so much to me and especially at this time in the professions and the nation's trajectory. So I'm incredibly grateful for this opportunity. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we meet on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Gabrielina Tongva people and their neighbors, including the Chumash, the Tataviam, the Kinatamuk, the Serrano, the Kuia, the Kumuyeye, and the Ketchdom peoples. The Organization of American Historians and the Japanese American National Museum acknowledge that indigenous stewardship and rightful claims to these lands have never been voluntarily relinquished nor legally extinguished. We pay respects to the members and elders of those communities, past, present, and future, who remain stewards, caretakers, and advocates of these lands, river systems, and the waters and the islands of the Santa Barbara Channel. Let us also pause to begin our time together acknowledging all we've been through these last three years, the intersecting, intersecting cyclone of crises, viral, racial, gender, economic, environmental, political, constitutional, and let us continue to hold close the millions of families who have lost loved ones due to COVID-19, mass shootings, and natural disasters. But let us come together today and every day acknowledging the hope, the resiliency, and the devotion to each other in the inextricable bonds of our shared humanity. Let us also commit to the work that lies ahead. So I'm so grateful to the Japanese American National Museum. I've been so fortunate to work with them throughout my career and with a mission to promote an understanding and appreciation of America's uh, ethnic and cultural diversity by sharing the Japanese American experience Janum generously and vigilantly shares the hard fought lessons accrued from this history and courageously and repeatedly takes stands, advocates and makes change happen, especially when diversity, individual dignity and social justice are undermined. An affiliate museum of the Smithsonian, like the National Museum of American History, we come together with a shared commitment to transform lives, create a more just America, and ultimately a better world. My deep thanks to the Organization of American Historians Leadership, uh, Executive, Doctor, uh, Executive Director Dr. Beth English, Heine Selby, my fellow board members, and a very special um, thank you uh, to just past president, uh, Dr. Erica Lee, and today uh, just president-elect Dr. David Light, who you'll see uh, in a minute and who has agreed to moderate this esteemed panel. The conference that Erica and her program committee and local arrangements committee crafted for the Organization of American Historians was so powerful. Uh, we just finished. This is actually the culminating event in that. And it really did achieve the goals of getting us thinking deeply about living in a new reality of crises, questions about how to do history. And confronting crises, the, the main theme um, uh, this after the colon was history in uncertain times. Um, truly did help us this, these last few days, not only come together in community as historians, uh, but to learn from each other and to acknowledge that constant crises, as Erica said last night, have always shaped the lives of all but the fraction of people whose social status has offered them comfort and reprieve, end quote. I'm very thankful for my home history department. Uh, this uh, program is co-sponsored by the UCLA Department of History, Gary V. Nash Endowed Chair in US History, the Thomas E. Leifka Endowed Chair of History, and another one of my mentors, Joyce Appleby Endowed Chair of America in the World. 
And this forum honors the late Gary B. Nash, a former president of the Organization of American Historians and a staunch defender of teaching history and all its complexity. Thus, it is a multi-layer joy to introduce Dr. Cindy Shelton, whose long career at the UCLA libraries and inspiring life partnerships with Gary helped bring today's conversations into a beautiful and personal focus. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Anthea. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I want to talk today about some of Gary's personal connections to his work to change how history was taught in the schools. He came of age in a very different era than most of the teachers today. And his history wars uh, are not the history wars of today's educators. But I think there are parallels, um, if not insights in his own experience on the front lines. I think it is worth noting that Gary was a privileged white male in the 1950s and 60s. He was too young to be a member of the old boys club, but he was a beneficiary. For example, UCLA hired Gary on a phone call. It probably went like this. The chair, chairman of the UCLA history department rang the chair of the Princeton History Department and asked who you got who can teach early American history. Professor Nash was on his way to the West Coast. That was 1966. It was about this time that Gary had what I'm going to call a conversion experience. The civil rights movement changed him as a person and a historian. It was this, as if he reached into his soul and yanked out part of that DNA he had. He became deeply affected by the cause for racial equality and justice. It not only altered the direction of his scholarship and teaching, but he became an activist. He worked on the ground in West LA to desegregate banks, supermarkets, and housing. He chaired the Angela De Davis Defense Committee when the University of California fired her for being a communist. That was 1969. Barry, Gary became active in the Vietnam anti-war protests on campus. For all this, the FBI hounded him. In this same period, Gary's scholarship changed focus. He evolved from his first book, Quakers and Politics, to his second title, The Great Fear, Race in the Mind of America, and then Red, White, and Black. So where am I going with this? Fast forward a good quarter century later to the history wars of the 1990s when the Lynn Cheney's and Rush Limbaugh's and Newt Gingrich's attacked Gary, they spoke in knee-jerk sound bites and cliches. Gary not only countered with an actual knowledge of history, but drew deeply on beliefs in social and racial justice. How so nonsensical and frivolous were the charges thrown at him of political correctness, the cliche of the day. It is no different in my mind than the current cliche of woke, weaponized into a soundbite against the educators today. Like Gary, you have a deep personal connection to and conviction in the history you teach and write. When Gary became founding co-director of the National Center for the History in the Schools in 1989, he plunged into what would become the second phase of his career, working with classroom teachers, history teachers, and scholars to revamp history education. It changed my life, 
he said, speaking of the collaboration with teachers. It changed my understanding of what historical literacy means. It changed my professional priorities. And then along came the National History Standards controversy of 1994, the centerpiece of the history wars of the 90s. Gary had loved to describe the creation of the National Standards as a process that built a bridge across what he called the Grand Canyon of teachers and scholars. Working together, scores of them drafted the national model to transform US and world history in the schools. Lynn Cheney, who had commissioned the History Center to create the teaching standards, then led the attack to tear them down. She led, she began the blizzard of criticism with an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal titled, The End of History. Cheney and Limbaugh were masters of the on-mic sound bites. Gary was not, but he learned quickly. His first national TV news interview opposite Cheney looked like this. Cheney poised in a well-lit, expansive network studio in DC in makeup, dressed to the nines. Gary sitting in some closet, literally, in UCLA's Murphy Hall with Klieg lights, wearing an ill-fitting blazer handed to him by some PR guy at UCLA. He held his own from the beginning and quickly got some of his own sound bites. And he purchased a, a nice blue blazer to carry him through the following interviews. He also grew what he described to me as a rhinoceros skin. He was the first to admit that the attacks on the standards were unpleasant. He hated the fight, he said, because of the misinformation spread by what he called ultra-conservative attackers in soundbite warfare. But he loved the war, his words. Why? It was about deeper questions about whether history instruction should be multicultural, inclusive, global, and based on the scholarship of this generation. That statement is just as relevant today as it was 30 years ago. The attacks on the standards climaxed with the US Senate voting to get, condemn them as un-American. Despite this victory for the right, some states and many localities adopted the standards. Gary did, Gary did not retreat back into academe after being painted as unpatriotic. He loved working with the teachers. He told me this many, many times. He found new granting agencies for the work of the center and established new collaborative efforts to bring history content and curricula alive in the schools. Gary remained director of the center and devoted himself to this work until he retired in 2013. Three weeks before Gary died, The Economist interviewed him for a podcast about history in the schools. This was in July, 2021. And CRT had become the centerpiece of the new history wars. Asked about comparing the standards controversy to the current battle Gary reminded us that these attacks are always connected to what's going on in politics at the time. Getting rich in the midterm elections in 1994, right? DeSantis in a presidential primary today. The last thing Gary said in the podcast was about the students. In a liberal democracy, we want a division of opinion the young people to argue about history and think hard about it. 
My niece opened her remarks at Gary's memorial, welcoming fellow members of the Gary Nash fan club, which was a beautiful sentiment. What I don't think she knew was that Gary really did have an honest to God national fan club with, car with card carrying members. Ac academic scholars don't have these. The members of his club weren't admiring graduate students or teachers. They were school kids. The fan club gave, gave him a superhero moniker, the Nationator, because he was such a badass. Students sent him fan mail. They made him stuff. A class from uh, Franklin High School here in LA gave him a leather cowboy hat inscribed with his name on the front and Mehor Professor on the side. That was 2010. One classroom of kids in Arkansas, I think, sewed him a red Superman cape with a big yellow N on, on it instead of an S. Few scholars or teachers ha have fan clubs. But if you are one of those educators who is confronting the current attacks on history, you are a superhero and the students know it. Like Gary did, hold on to the high ground. Don't let history be erased. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, uh, I think brought a tear to many of our eyes as we remember as we remember Gary's power and Gary's inspiration and what he uh, did and uh, still does, I think, for all of us. Um, so um, it is now uh, a pleasure to uh, bring up the panel and uh, to do so, I have the honor of introducing uh, David Blight. David, as many of you know, is the Sterling Professor of African American Studies and of American Studies and Director of the Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University. Previously, David was a professor at Amherst, where he taught for 13 years. A winner of many a book prize. Okay, we're going to do a little do -si do your partner here. Many of you, of course, know him for his, the remarkable award-winning Bancroft uh, Frederick Douglass Prize for Race and Reunion, um, the Civil War in American History, and the Pulitzer Prize and the Lincoln Prize for Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. And in 2021, he was elected to um, the American Philosophical Society and has been uh, an incredible partner for Erica and, and I as we transition our Organization of American Historian Leadership and a, a true uh, and remarkable uh, thinker and very generous man who's brought together this beautiful panel. Okay. And thank you again. Thank you again for coming. Thank you, Cindy. And thank you, my esteemed panelists. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank you all in the uh, uh, live stream audience. Uh, we welcome your questions. I have a little pad here on which the live stream questions will appear soon. Uh, thank you, Anthea. Um, it's been a remarkable OAH gathering here in Los Angeles. A lot of us had the pleasure to hear Erica Lee's uh, sobering, brilliant uh, presidential address last night. It was a great Jeremiah about some of these issues. Um, I just want to say a few things, and then I will introduce this panel. They're all going to speak for a, a short time each, and then I'll throw some questions up, and we're going to welcome your questions at about 2.45. That's Los Angeles time, if you're out in the remote audience. Um, I was a high school teacher for seven years, first seven years of my career in Flint, Michigan, large urban high school. Uh, in a still prosperous automobile town. Uh, when I left in about 1978, uh, the turn in the auto industry was beginning to happen. Uh, three of the four high schools in Flint are now closed, I regret to say. Um, I still think the best and most important teaching, at least, that I ever did was at the high school level. 
I still believe that, no matter where else I've had the privilege to teach. And by the way, uh, Cindy, uh, Gary was one of my teachers, though he didn't know it. Uh, I've taught at least four of his books. I used to teach Red, Black, and White in my survey, U.S. History. Just last fall, I taught History on Trial, a book on the standards in a seminar on the history wars. It was the, the lead book. And tomorrow, a senior thesis is about to be turned in at Yale, which is all based upon that. So I'm soon to be reading all about uh, the history standards debate. I actually have already read it. But anyway, um, so Gary had a huge place in that uh, course I just taught. Uh, there's a stirring and dangerous movement in the land, which most of us here are aware of, uh, against um, the spirit of public education and perhaps even the existence of it. I personally think that, though I don't know how to exactly get this launched, what the United States needs is a moonshot for public schools, a moonshot for teachers. Uh, we had a moonshot for the moon. Now we have a moonshot for cancer, and no one's against that. But no one should be against a moonshot for public schools. I mean, a really big moonshot. Uh, I think the public school is the most democratic institution the United States ever created. All my education comes from public schools, which is not to denigrate private universities or colleges or schools. I now teach in, I've actually taught in three of them, but all my education comes from public schools. If they didn't exist in the Midwest, most of us wouldn't have any education. Um, but now we have yet again, chapter nine, of America's history wars, or whichever chapter it is, um, where a large segment of our society, once again, wants history to be that which pleases them, that which makes them sleep well at night, that which makes them comfortable, that which may not disrupt their sense of the narratives they want to live in, or that they think they have inherited. And I don't mean to denigrate anybody with that. Everybody probably has a wish to find interesting and exciting ancestors and to live in a narrative that's somehow uplifting. And I mean, who, who wouldn't want that in some form, I suppose? But we have this movement again for various reasons, many of them political, as Cindy said, that doesn't want us to trouble the conscience of youth, uh, doesn't want us to ask the uncomfortable questions. And the list is so long, isn't it? And whenever you start making this list, most of us wonder, well, what then, or what would we teach if we can't teach these things? Race, gender, LGBTQ life and identity uh, and rights, uh, war and peace. Um, poverty, violence, slavery, the slave trade, um, human exploitations of all kinds, religion, always a complicated, divisive set of questions that is so important in American history. Um, how about class? We still don't quite have a language to teach about class as we do some others. We've done much better at, at, at perhaps ethnicity and race and gender than we have necessarily about class. Who teaches about class explicitly? Or that constitution? <laughs> you do, I know. Well, we've got a panelist who's written five books on that, six, seven books on that. And by the way, Robin just asked me not to name all of his books when I quickly introduce him. So there, I'm not naming all of his books. Um, but the constitution, a last point about this. Think how much it's come back into our public discourse. Oh my goodness. Uh, the Constitution is by definition divisive. <laughs> Just look at it. I mean, federalism forever will be a divisive subject. Uh, what about the amendments? That 14th Amendment, Section 1 of the 14th Amendment defines us. And it will be forever debated. The Second Amendment, good Lord. You know, even to mention it sometimes in polite company is to get the subject changed. Or the First Amendment, forever a divisive, debated uh, question. What is free speech? Or the Fifth Amendment. Good Lord, if we had figured out the Fifth Amendment perfectly, we might not have had a civil war. 
That's a little overstated. But, but seriously, that right to property? Anyway, one could go on. So many of these divisive issues. Now, that doesn't mean you don't stop and when, when, there's a, when there's a triumph of some kind in history and you appreciate it. God knows. It doesn't mean all we do is teach the dark side of human experience. Uh, but if we didn't, we wouldn't be doing history. Now, it's a special thrill to introduce this group because these are all teachers or people engaged with teachers and educating teachers and doing development for teachers. Um, I'm going to do this as quick as I can, and then we get right to the discussion today of this crisis about teaching and history and creating knowledge for young people. Carolee Wong Nakatatsu is a middle school U.S. history teacher. Uh, she's been a middle school teacher since 1990. Uh, she was the California Council for Social Studies Teacher of the Year just this year, I believe. She's the Gilder Lehrman Institute Teacher of the Year in 2019. She was the Gilder Lehrman, she is on the Gilder Lehrman Teacher Advisory Group. Gilder Lehrman Institute and is something I know a lot about. I run a center named for that too. She's on all sorts of other teacher advisory groups, the Monticello Advisory Group, the U.S. 2050 History Education Council, and her book is called Bring History and Civics to Life, Lessons and Stereotypes um, to Cultivate Informed and Empathetic Citizens. We need a civics movement in this country too. Orlando Serrano Jr. is the manager of uh, you, the youth and teacher programs at the National Museum of American History. He's Anthea's colleague. Uh, he runs programs for students and professional de development for teachers, um, does curricular development. Um, his programs include, it's a long list, but they include just a few of them. Let's Do History Tour, American Innovations, Becoming the, U the United States, and Latinos in Baseball, which is an exhibit that I have not seen yet. Is it still up? No, it is? Good. I got to get there to that. Um, he's had all kinds of fellowships, Ford, National Science Foundation, and so forth. Lynn Yamasaki is Director of Education at the Japanese American National Museum and Project Director of Little Tokyo here. Um, uh, Little Tokyo, How History Shapes a Community Across Generations. Um, she's been here at the museum since 2007. She runs all sorts of programming for students, teachers, and families. And she previously was at the Smithsonian, I think the Hirshhorn um, uh, Sculpture Garden in particular. Um, session here on the OAH. And the last two members of our panel are Daniel Diaz, director of the UCLA History Geography Project and a former high school teacher. Uh, he's the former director and project of Project Deviant, a nonprofit supporting foster youth in the San Gabriel Valley. He runs workshops, professional development for K-12 teachers, especially who, who uh, do training in local history and social justice. His own research is about the impact of local history on student engagement, and he does all sorts of support work for teachers learning to do ethnic studies. Robin D.G. Kelly is one of the, the great American historians of our time. He's Distinguished Professor and Gary Nash Chair, Endowed Chair at UCLA. That's all he wanted me to tell you. So maybe I will stop, except you got to read his biography of Thelonious Monk. You got to read his book, Hammer and Ho, which was his first book. <laughs> and there are three, four others much worth reading uh, in the history of, of African-Americans, of labor, of class and race. Uh, now, I've asked each of them to take five, seven minutes and give us their own take at this moment on this crisis as we've identified it. Uh, though I also joked with them in, in backstage where 
I said, you know, I'll, I'll lay out the Jeremiah and all that's wrong, and then you all have to uplift us. <laughs> so uh, any order, how about we just go in the order of the line? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for being here at Janum with us. Um, so I think to kind of speak towards a museum's role and our how we see our role in at this time is um, how we can best support teachers and figuring out how it is that we can do that. Um, here at Janum, we definitely, we are a collecting institution. And so we really, um, we really do, I think, see that as our greatest asset is our collection. And in essence, that's, that's proof, proof that history happened. Um, and so we have documents and photographs and artifacts um, and voices that we share with our students and teachers when they come here. Um, we definitely want to be a space where people can question things, can discover things, can hopefully feel free to having their minds changed by what they see here um, and to discover something about themselves when they come here. Um, and Thea shared the, the mission of the museum um, here, which is, you know, again, to promote an understanding and appreciation of America's ethnic and cultural diversity by sharing the Japanese American experience. So really stressing that though we are the Japanese American National Museum, that is, we are not just about this one community story. Um, this story does not exist in a vacuum. It is activated by, by all the other stories that it um, intersects with. And so I think when we really think about how to how to confront histories that are hard and to confront histories that are difficult. Um, as, as a museum, we always look towards, towards our stuff. Um, we have a lot of it. And you know we have students who come here every day. Um, and I think our approach as a museum is to really, or as a museum educator, is to, um, to really allow students to make their own discoveries and their own conclusions about history in looking at these these things, right? Um, kind of the belief that the more information we give, we are closing the door for inter interpretation by students. And so we really do stress and try to um, model this idea of like allowing learners to, to have student-driven experiences and to really look at something, have a dialogue about it, maybe have an argument about it. But maybe, you know, we really do hope that history is, you know, clearly on display on our walls. Um, and so that's kind of, I think what we see our strength is again, is in, in the objects um, and how it is that we can use those to support teachers who are, are faced with challenges in the classroom is where we, we see ourselves. All right, um, hello everybody. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all on the panel for sharing time with me today. Um, I may have done the assignment wrong, so I'm gonna put that out there um, right away. Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, I, uh, I think about history as stories and storytelling, right? Um, and so I wanna talk about a little, a little bit about the import of stories, why they matter, um, why, the work that I do at the National Museum of American History, um, it's important that we have an accurate accounting um, of what has happened. Um, so uh, I'm gonna open up with a, a quote and I apologize for folks who were with me on Friday, but I turn to Leslie Marmon Silko often um, in her opening of ceremony and talking about stories. And she writes, I will tell you something about stories. They aren't just entertainment, don't be fooled. They are all we have, you see, all we have to fight off illness and death. You do not have anything if you don't have the stories. So they try to destroy the stories, let the stories be confused or forgotten. They would like that. They would be happy because we would be defenseless then. So he rubbed his belly. I keep them here, he said. Here, put your hand on it. See, it is moving. There's life here for the people in the stories. So... And thinking about the work that you know we do at American History, that I get to do with teachers, I draw heavily on the work that I did as a ninth grade teacher before I joined American History. And um, 
I got to work with a wonderful group of black and brown kids in DC for close to six years, learning with them. And I, I think that that's something that I, I want to point out. I was not there to teach. I was there to learn. I was there to practice the process of education, right? And um, in our time together, we leaned on stories for exactly what Leslie Marmon Sokol advises us they are for, to defend ourselves, to stay alive. And um, this past year, um, my son organized a walkout um, in Virginia uh, with regard to the anti-trans legislation that's happening, right? Um, and in talking with him, um, and I mentioned this on Friday when we got to sit with five amazing women who organized the walkouts here in 1968, right? And so I talked with my son about this story and where this comes from, right? Why he knows what to do, right? Because that's the, also, the other important part about the stories. It's important that we share them because they happened and because they matter. But as my mentor often reminds me, theory is a guide for action. Ruthie tells me all the time. It's not about what happened, but it's about what to do. So my son knew what to do because he knew what happened. And that's why we need to keep these stories together. And in thinking about the stories and writing them down and documenting them, it's not just about recording and it's not just about instruction and guidance, but it's also about creation. Right? And so our neighbors at the National Museum of African American History and Culture just opened an exhibit called Afrofuturism. And the, for me, the uh, um, artifact, the object that draws me to it over and over again, just as the same in our museum, are typewriters. In our museum, the typewriter of Maya Angelou, and in the mock, Octavia Butler's typewriter. Because in the stories, again, we don't have just a document or a record of what occurred or instruction or guidance on what to do, but we have portals into what is possible when we do these things. And so that's why these stories matter. And with regard to classrooms and why classrooms matter, I want to end my time um, going to one of the folks who mentored me, though I never had a privilege to meet her, Bell Hooks, who writes, the classroom with all its limitation remains a location of possibility in that field of possibility, we have the opportunity to labor for freedom, to demand of ourselves and our comrades an openness of mind and heart that allows us to face reality, even as we collectively imagine ways to move beyond boundaries, to transgress. This is education as the practice of freedom. Thank you. Some of us grew up on typewriters. Yeah, yeah. So. See, I think you got an A for that one. No, yeah, I, I thought, that's an A. I'm no, revising my. I thought that I thought was I thought was fantastic. Um, okay, so I'm I've I've actually prepared something because I I would go on and on and on, and I only have five six minutes. Uh, first of all, I'm really happy to be here. It's very important uh, for me, and um, for lots of reasons. You know, um, I hold the Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair, and with each passing day, I'm more and more honored. Um, what that means. You know, and it's like I looked down and his 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 shoes kept getting bigger and my feet don't grow that fast, you know. Um, but it it's it's a it's a huge honor. And I don't think I would want any other endowed chair other than the one I hold right now. Um now what I want to do, I really want to focus a little bit on the most recent controversy around the AP African American studies uh, course, because I think it's relevant. And I just want to lay out sort of three or four points for discussion. One, what is different about this moment uh, is that, uh, first of all, history wars go on since the 19th century, well before that. Uh, but what's different about this time is that the right is wielding the power of state legislatures to enforce their bans and to really remake K through college education. And they are able to pass these laws that have real teeth. Uh, backed by a right-leaning judiciary. I mean, you're talking about laws that can turn uh, classroom activities into felonies. Uh, they, there's 42 states that have passed or introduced laws banning or limiting uh, the teaching of race and gender or what they're calling CRT. 
It's a mistake to think this, think of this though as a cultural war uh, or as a matter of ignorance versus enlightenment. And one of the things that annoys me is this, this tired argument that if only Ron DeSantis took a black studies course, you know, or fill in the blanks. Um, and, you know, or if the populace only knew African-American history, our great achievements, blah, 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 we wouldn't be afraid of black studies, okay? Now, in fact, this political and legislative attack on history education is not even about presenting the US in a positive light. Uh, if it was, we'd be emphasizing abolitionists, indigenous nations, uh, not only uh, as early models of democracy, but for their heroic fight to uphold the principles of sovereignty and resist the settler colonial onslaught, we will be examining how formerly enslaved people made this noble effort to democratize the South and the entire country during Reconstruction. We'll be talking about the resistance and internment camps uh, by Japanese Americans who tried to uphold democracy against this onslaught. Uh, we'd be talking about women suffragists and feminists who are trying to expand democracy. And remind me to tell you a very funny story about a Halloween costume, but we'll, I'll save that. Uh, so why would these politicians and right-wing ideologues not want to teach the history of movements that tried to make sure every person enjoyed freedom and safety, that wanted to end slavery, Jim Crow, patriarchy, and sex discrimination? I mean, if we live in a country that is supposedly built on the principles of freedom and democracy, wouldn't teaching about how courageous people risk their lives to ensure freedom and democracy for themselves and others be considered a good thing? That's positive light, right? The implication, of course, is the implication of this right wing logic is that America is great. Slavery was a good, good idea at the time. And anti racism, anti racism sullied our noble tradition. And when the federal government attempted to ban slavery and racism in states, this was a case of overreach. Now, why attack anti-racism? Because these kinds of bans and curricular changes are meant to, to and follow me here, to turn anti-racists, anti-sexists into the enemy and the people identified as white as the victim. Marginalized white working people are victims of stagnant wages, privatized healthcare, big pharma, tax policies that redistribute wealth upwards. This is class. And they're taught that they lived in what was once a perfect country until the woke mob took over and gave their hard earned income to black people and other people and immigrants. And now they're trying to take their guns. That's the narrative. That's not positive. Now what we're witnessing, I contend, um, is not so much a cultural war as much as a struggle over power shoring up a fragile hair and vogue republic based on class rule and white supremacy. So no wonder then that conservative legislature, legislators and the well-funded parent groups like Moms for Liberty who gets its money from foundations believe that an anti-racist curriculum will make their children uncomfortable. It's not an accident that anti-racist baby this is a cute little book. It's held up as subversive literature, whereas there's no commensurate movement to ban books that promote racism. Thomas Jefferson's Notes on Virginia, the pro-slavery writings of John C. Calhoun, Edmund Ruffin, the scientific racism of Samuel Cartwright, Dr. Josiah Knott, George Fitzhugh, Lucas Agassiz, Herbert Spencer, Madison Grant, Lothrop Stoddard. No, those books are not being banned. A second point, very quickly, which may not seem immediately uh, relevant or obvious, but I think is essential, um, is that the more opaque objective is, you know, in some of these policies is to further transform universities into engines of market fundamentalism and privatization beholden to business. So if you read Florida's Bill 999, it states that universities, quote, have the greatest capacity to promote the state's economic development through new research, technology, patents, grants, and contracts that, quote, generate state businesses of global importance. The university's new mission is to create a resource-rich academic environment that attracts high technology business and venture capital to the state. That's what they're trying to do. How's that gonna benefit white working people? Seriously. Um, so the Board of Governors is tasked with developing a strategic plan to remake the state university into the engine of capitalist development. Last point. As we rightfully focus on the attacks on the AP-AFM curriculum and CRT, 
we need to discuss the role of the College Board and its capitulation to the right. Just a few days before the release of the final version of the curriculum, I was in a private meeting with Ken Yamada Taylor, Kim Crenshaw, uh, Cheryl Harris, with uh, College Board members, leaders rather, Trevor Packer, Steve Bombal, and others. And Packer assured us in his words that neither we nor the AP Development Committee received any input from Florida. The emails show otherwise. When I called him out on it, he actually threatened to sue me. This is the College Board. I got the emails to prove it. Um, the complicity of the College Board is not surprising, nor is it new, because remember the AP uh, uh, revisions, the revisions of the U AP US history curriculum in 2014 went to these revisions where teachers who felt it was inadequate, you know, uh, and scholars, you know, revised it to focus more on conflict, putting more about race and racism, settler violence, uh, dealing with slavery, the Civil War, um, uh, uh, ideology of manifest destiny. And then the right went off, much like what Gary experienced early on. They, the Republican National Committee passed a resolution accusing it of emphasizing, quote, the negative aspects of our, hist our nation's history while omitting or minimizing positive aspects and argued that race and gender are divisive concepts. Ben Carson, my favorite Negro, even, even said, and I quote, most people who complete this course would be ready to sign up for ISIS. Uh, look it up. So they called for a congressional investigation, Lynn Cheney got behind it, and the College Board in 2015 caved. They, they made these compromises and included elimination of any discussion of racism, and the word racist and xenophobia were eliminated from the curriculum. So my point is that we're always looking at the fascists, but liberalism often underwrites that. So we have to be really careful about, you know, just it's easy to attack Florida and Texas and Iowa and Arkansas and all these people, but sometimes what's happening comes from people that we think are our friends. So we really have to be vigilant and understand like how significant these battles are, not just the ones in, in public, but the ones behind the scenes. Thank you. My name is Carolee Wong Nakatsuka. I've had the joy and pleasure of bringing US history to life for my eighth grade students in Southern California for the past 30 years. Last week, I attended the National Council for History Education Conference in Salt Lake City. I enjoyed learning from and interacting with outstanding educators from across the country, hearing updates about the AP African American History Pilot, and sitting on a panel entitled Teaching Under a Microscope, Reflections from Educators Facing External Challenges. During this conference, I noticed that when educators from states facing book bans and laws limiting the teaching of history spoke, the audience let out a heavy sigh. When educators from a state like mine, California, not facing these restrictive bills, the response was more positive, maybe like a sigh of relief. Before the panel, I admit that I too shared many of these prejudices and assumptions, especially that my colleagues facing restrictions could not really teach a full history curriculum. It's true that we listen with heavy hearts to the restrictions placed upon them and the fears this understandably produces, especially amongst new teachers. But I was also impressed and inspired by these teachers' courage their convictions and passion as they shared all they continue to do in their classrooms within the confines of these laws to raise up a generation of informed critically thinking students and citizens. And I realized that just as history is full of complexity and nuance, the teaching of history is also full of complexity and nuance. Good teaching is happening in states with restrictions. Teachers who teach in states without these restrictive laws still face challenges though these challenges may be more subtle. Contrary to the popular belief of many, my state, California, is not monolithic. There's great diversity throughout within our state, within regions, even within cities and districts. California has done many things to cultivate a more inclusive, diverse history curriculum. The FAIR Act of 2011 calls for a fair, accurate, inclusive, and respectful representation of our diverse ethnic and cultural population in K-12 history and social science curriculum. Our framework, updated in 2016, is robust and inquiry-based, promoting critical thinking, reading, writing, citizenship, and an understanding of our world. We are one of several states with an ethnic studies requirement, requiring a one-semester curriculum that more closely reflects the history, culture, and struggles of California's diverse population. But California also has its challenges. Our standards adopted in 1998 have not been revised. 
When the framework was updated, I've heard that they received 10,000 comments reminding us that revising history standards and frameworks can be challenging, contentious, and controversial, even in California. Personally, I have found this to be a challenging year in my classroom, perhaps one of the most challenging, a sentiment I hear echoed by my colleagues across the country. Students, teachers, and parents are still recovering from remote learning during the pandemic. Many students lack confidence. Many parents are uncomfortable. Many teachers are tired and our administrators face the challenges of dealing with and supporting all of these entities who are expressing legitimate concerns while at the same time implementing and following state and district mandates and initiatives. They need to, uh, students need community and connection. They need safe opportunities to practice being brave and practice being a citizen in the safety of our classrooms and our schools so they can apply these lessons in all of their spaces, especially in the outside world. They need to see representation in the pages of our history books. They need to see people who don't look like them and people who do like, look like them to learn how the decisions they made in the past affected people in real ways and continue to affect us today. They need to see that they and all of us are part of the we and we the people and that they have the power and the ability to make a difference. At the NCHE conference, award-winning and distinguished professor Joanne Freeman stated that the fight for history is the fight for democracy. The only way we can understand where we are, how we got here and how we might do better is to reckon with the past for all of its ugliness as well as for its ideals. As Professor Freeman likes to say, it behooves us to tell a complicated story. Teaching shapes democracy because democracy is an ongoing conversation. History teachers are a vital part of this ongoing conversation. History teachers need to be supported as we work to uphold our democracy and as we teach students to be critically thinking, informed, engaged, and empathetic citizens who will work to close the gap between our ideals and our realities. Students will make a difference and make our world a better place. I had the distinct honor and pleasure to meet Dr. Erica Lee at the Chinese American Museum Los Angeles Gala this past September. I admit I was a bit starstruck and hesitant to meet her. I've attended her webinars, especially love reading America for Americans in a Twitter chat book club with fellow history teachers, a chat that Dr. Lee also graciously and generously participated in. I appreciated her work and I am a big fan. Somehow I mustered up the courage to say hi and was so delighted and appreciative, even relieved at how friendly and personal she was. It has been said that you have to see it to believe it. Representation does matter. Thanks to Dr. Lee and so many others who look like me, I have found my history voice, and I continue to do all I can to speak up for outstanding, inclusive, and representative teaching of history so that my students will see themselves in the, story of, um, in the story of America, that they too will find their representation and will use voices, their voices to make a difference. I'm grateful to, to OAH for hosting this and, and many important conversations about the teaching of history. I'm grateful for the Japanese American National Museum for hosting this event and being a vital part of telling this representative, inclusive part of America's story. It was a profound experience to travel with these exhibits with my daughter today, the granddaughter of both a 97-year-old incarceree and a World War II vet, and the great-granddaughter of a Chinese immigrant who bravely entered America in spite of the Chinese Exclusion Act. I end by quoting Dr. Lee from her op-ed published in The Hill yesterday, Great reading, I highly recommend it. We all have a role to play in the current war against history. Our work should be collaborative and coalitional. When teams of historians, teachers, students, community organizations, curators, and professionals group work together, we are powerful. We must continue to practice, teach, and advocate for new ways to produce, preserve, and share history that democratizes American history and leads to social, economic, and political change. Not just for today, but for tomorrow as well. Yes, history matters, representation matters, democracy matters, we are truly better together. Thank you. Danny. Yes, <laughs> I should have chose the front of this uh, panel. It's really hard to follow um, all of that. So I was kind of making edits to the, my notes so I'm not redundant, um, but I would, uh, I like to start off um, every sort of introduction um, just to kind of bring in my, uh, who I am and what brings me to this work. And so first and foremost, um, the son of Susan and Daniel Diaz, 
and um, the fourth generation Mexican descendant of field workers and uh, bricklayers and railroad workers and roughnecks and beauticians and truck drivers. And I'm very proud of that, that blue collar labor kind of history that got me to this point. I'm also the first fam uh, person in my family to graduate college. And so that always sticks with me um, because some of the stories that my family experienced are not in history classrooms. These things happened in Los Angeles, segregated schools in La Puente where some of my family members are from. There's power in local history and there's truth in local history. And I wanna return back to that in a minute. Um, so the work that I, that I used to do was a K-12 teacher. I taught high school for 13 years. Um, I taught in Boyle Heights at Roosevelt High School, which back then had 6,000 students. Uh, it was tracked so that all 6,000 weren't on campus. A very clear sort of introduction to the system then. And it became very apparent, oh, this is very political, right, and economic. Um, and then I went back to my hometown, San Gabriel Valley, I consider my hometown, and taught in uh, Pico Rivera. I'm very proud of teaching, uh, teaching at El Rancho High School and the, the connections I made in that community. Um, so, oh, and also I just want to make clear the nonprofit I started was called Project Deviate, not Deviant. Um, I didn't want to make it seem like I was working with foster youth and I thought they were deviants. It's <laughs> not it. It was trying to help them circumvent, you know, barriers that were, you know, not. Did I say there. deviant? Yeah, it's okay. Deviate. <laughs> it's okay. I just wanted to clear that up because you're like, what's, what's up with that? Um, so I, I wanted to clear that up. The work that I, that I, um, that I currently do is to provide professional development support to history teachers, amazing ones like Carly. Um, to because because teaching is it's, it's a political act. I mean, it, it really is when you're a history teacher, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, it's it's a, it's a political in nature. And sometimes it heats up like now, sometimes it cools off and it doesn't feel that way. And I think that teachers in the history classroom move on a spectrum, or at least we would like to, um, because sometimes the conversation is I want to stay neutral or not. But there's a sort of spectrum. And I think this is sort of a moment for us to to kind of uh um, sit up a little bit, take attention, um, take some responsibility, even if we're in California, really play a place that feels sort of secluded and in a good way and protected um, from the rest of the country, but also sort of recognize that we have these issues in our own backyard, right? We're seeing this play out in, in school board meetings and things like that. Um, so that that's kind of the work that I do. And I'm part of an organization that helped create the framework um, that Carolee was mentioning. And that is really inspired. My, my path here is inspired by Gary in a lot of ways. I met Gary in like 2000, I believe, or 99. And I was a senior at Whittier College. And my professor, Laura McEnany, who's still a really dear friend, introduced me to Gary and sort of shaped her teaching around what Gary was trying to do with history education. And it changed my life because my high school history education was really bad. It, if it's if the it purpose was to sort of produce somebody who sort of had no connection to history, no relevance, sort of going through the world without a historical consciousness, then it succeeded. Um, but the moment that I simply started to learn about stories that I wasn't taught, even like Malcolm X and the Panthers in, Cer in community college where, in Cerritos, where I got to shout out those amazing historians, um, it was life changing. And so I wanted to do that same thing as to for students in my community, for kids in my community, um, because it was so impactful um, for me. So I think that that's really important um, to sort of lay that that groundwork. And just to, to kind of just say a couple of more things, you know, this organization that I'm part of now, the California History Social Science Project, during the, the pandemic of 2020 and the movement for Black Lives, we sort of had this thought experiment. It would be like, what what would we have liked to have done in the 60s if we were history teachers? How would we have met that moment? And how was that moment being met by the public at that time? And we start pulling out Gallup polls and we share with teachers and look at the things that they're saying about Martin Luther King in the sit-ins and what the kind of language that they're using. And it's very similar to the language that's being used today. And so I get courage in the work that I do when I reflect on what educators were doing in the past. I get courage when I think about the blowouts in East LA and when we think about the movement, like the Black Panther Party and how they laid out their 10 points, if you look at those documents and we ask our teachers to help students do this, those students are calling out education and they're calling out history classrooms because they want more inclusive histories that represent them. So there's like a legacy and sort of a trajectory um, and, and sort of teaching true 
um, sort of more inclusive history. So the work that I do now is to collaborate with teachers to inspire students with engaging and relevant history. And so we try to provide opportunities, fair act opportunities. It's great that this content exists, but our teachers don't have the time to do all of this research on their own. It's kind of one of the systemic things we learn quickly about teachers. Teachers by nature have to be subversive to work around the system. You have to, right? In order to grade, in order to be there from eight to five and then balance your work life, you have to be subversive and you have to find ways to make things happen when, when they can't. And one of the ways that um, one of the, my role is to help teachers um, have the content knowledge needed to teach this sort of more inclusive history. We, we in California get to teach about LGBTQ history. Unfortunately, a lot of history teachers do not know LGBTQ history, right? As no fault of their own, it just wasn't a thing that was really taught. So we're trying to offer curriculum and in, in, uh, professional development opportunities and talks from scholars who can help teachers up their content knowledge. And we also offer this um, to anybody. If it's a Zoom one, so we've had folks from Texas, we've had folks from different states come into our workshops, and we feel like in a way we want to continue to build the support system um, for, for history educators. I think I've rambled a lot, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap, <laughs> wrap this up, but thank you so much. Danny, you didn't ramble, and uh, I have to say, I well, I'm not going to take any time to say what I admire about all five of your presentations, but Danny, the fact that you're going back to actually examine what people might have struggled to teach in the 60s, 70s, whatever, is, is extremely important because we, we tend to think that what's happened in the, only in the last year or two is what's relevant. Uh, and I'm unfortunately old enough to have been educated in the 60s and I taught in the 70s. Um, I mean, it was a raw time. We were inventing courses called Black History in the 70s. We had no textbooks. Uh, I, I got the school library to buy John O. Franklin's Slavery to Freedom. I got him to buy Kenneth Stamp. because the only book I knew on slavery, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we didn't know what we were doing, but we had, we had a course called Black History. Uh, so, I mean, too bad there wasn't some more oral history done in some ways with teachers, and somebody should be doing that today. I want to ask all five of you one question before we go to, we're going to have to go to Q&A from the audience fairly quickly. Um, we're, we tend to agree on almost everything we're saying here, whether it's what goes on the wall in your fabulous museum uh, and, oh, my goodness, Orlando, I, 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 I wanted to cheer when you started talking about stories, because in the academy now, in some precincts of the academy, um, if you start talking about story, people will wonder what your theory is, and you haven't stated your theory. <laughs> no, no, man, the public wants a story, and we have to keep reminding ourselves. Of anyway, but I want to ask all of you uh, if you comment on this. Let's assume our audience is Governor DeSantis's educational team, whoever that is. And any Republican controlled state legislature that is passing these laws, that we actually get in the room with them. We, we almost never do. And they don't want us there. But let's assume that's our audience. Right now, what will you say to them? Let's go in reverse order. So you, you won't have to, Danny, you won't no, have to got, do mop up. I'm a, <laughs> no, no, I got, I actually have like a, I have a, like an idea. So yes, Good. what I would, I would right. do is I would bring in, I would try to find some old memory laws that were passed in like Russia and like all these other countries where oh, they good, just really good. restricted the kind of teaching of history. And I try to bring them in and then I would want to compare them to whatever this policy said and do a little teaching experiment. That's what I want to do. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that's memory my laws. first reaction. I'm a teacher. That's the first thing is like, how can I? How about South things? Africa? I mean, that, all yeah. sorts of models. Soviet Union. Yes. Today's Russia. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. Carolee. I would. I would take the um the Japanese American museums um, what's it called? Don't fence me in, or was it the 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 um exhibit? I loved it for the historical empathy that it that it 
cultivate it and I would bring it to the to the off to his Santos's to Santos's office and have him look at these stories of real people who experience life in the incarceration camps with these parents who are feeling uncomfortable trying to take care of their students um, and convincing hey bring in these programs of the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts come in because we're we're scared we want to take care of our kids so they don't turn into delinquents that that's to my daughter so so share those stories with DeSantis wow okay <laughs> It's a trick question. It is. It's a totally trick question. Because for a couple of reasons, um, it's a great question. And 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 I reserved an entire morning with DeSantis' team, by the way. Because so, um, so it's, it's, a, it's an argument you can't win. For, and let me tell you right. why. Um, one, DeSantis is no dummy. He has a, right. a bachelor's degree in history from Yale University. I know, yeah. And, there are plenty of people and, around who taught him. Or I have to they say, did. and he was there. I didn't. He was there at a time when he had an, you know, like Yale's always had an outstanding history faculty. So it's not like he doesn't know. So to me, it's not about him not knowing. It's, it's all about, as you said at the in your opening remarks, it's um, a kind of cynical ploy. Um, although, you know, look, Mussolini was brilliant and he was a socialist and he knew exactly what to do to produce the level of fascism and he attacked that, education first. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, fascism is not about um, about sort of having a bad argument. Um, so, and the other thing about, about uh, you know, Ron DeSantis's crew, the person who wrote uh, the Stop Woke Act was Manny Diaz Jr. Who's Manny Diaz Jr.? He made a hell of a lot of money off of charter schools. Mm -hmm. So there's stuff behind here that has nothing to do with actual sort of education, it has still capital. Yeah. You know, so I have all kinds of stories I could tell uh, th those folks. I can always prove them wrong, um, but it, it won't win the argument. And if I had to sort of do one sort of intellectual thing, I would give them. Tara Hunter's brilliant piece in the nation about indoctrination, because she grew up in Florida where they were teaching anti-communism. You were forced to take a course on Americanism to sort of rid your mind of, of communism. So he's talking about indoctrination. Florida has a long history of indoctrination. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's an example of, of, of what, what they're continuing to do, but you, you can't win that one. Orlando, with that charge, you can't win. You're going to still try, though. Come on, come on. Um, well, I agree with Robin, first of all. <laughs> um, but I, I, I didn't. I'd like to hear. I'd, I'd like to have a conversation about the purpose of schools, right? Like, and so mm -hmm. for for me, it'd be the you know we we're talking about this a little bit in the back. Like, there's a difference between schooling and learning, and and you know if we're approaching the idea of a school as an ideological state apparatus, right? As Althusser has talked to, told us about, then it's doing what it's supposed to be doing or it's, it's being crafted in a manner that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is everything Robin just mentioned. But if we imagine these places called classrooms as places to learn, that's very different. So that's what I would say. Good. Great. Lynn, you gonna take an exhibit in or what? Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think probably to connect on a personal level, I introduce myself, tell some, tell my story, right? Because I think, um, you know, we see this magic happen when we have people connecting to each other, like on a one-on-one -on -one basis, or like intergenerational connecting, especially, is very powerful. Right. So I, as the daughter of people who were forcibly removed from their homes during World War II, who was, you know, in growing up, not told the story by my family or by my teachers, right, who there is there was like a degree of shame involved in my identity, but it's only in learning the history of my community and other communities who have struggled and overcome that I start to feel a sense of pride over who I am and therefore find the courage to to tell my story and to to see where it can um, where it can play a role in other people feeling proud of who they are. Great, and you know, uh, you all did what you you do so well, and and what you know how to do. You went to irony. 
And that's that is what I mean. I, I've often said irony makes the world go round. I mean, it wouldn't be any history without irony. I mean, it wouldn't be any. Uh, but irony doesn't win arguments. That that's that's political organizing might. You know, it, it, and I'm not suggesting. I mean, if we actually got a half a day in this room with these people, and the doors are locked, and they can't leave, and they gotta listen to us. You know, God wish for that. You know, right? Uh, we we could start with our stories. You bet, stories, stories, and embed them in a story, get, get them invested in a story. You know the outcome. They may not even know the outcome, uh, and, and we're gonna we're gonna kill them with irony, right? But irony, irony doesn't kill in politics, or it doesn't work in politics often. Um, it's it's usually you know numbers. Power and organizing. I mean, it's the Koch brothers supporting all these mothers groups. Well, that's why the Dream, the dream Defenders, they occupied the state house. I mean, yeah. in other words, there's organizing going on all the time, and we should support that. Yeah. But you're so right. Um, all these organizations that are considered like parent groups, yeah. they're well-funded. They're not really, I mean, they're parents in them, but they get all this money. Yeah. And so we have to fight the political fight. And I think you're right about mm -hmm. that. I want to go to questions, but I do want to say uh, on the positive side of this, and Carol Lee, you reminded me of that backstage, ever since the history standards, right when the history standards was all over the news, and it was in the wake of the nation at risk studies and all those studies of excellence and nobody knew in American history and so on and so on, and we still have those studies, but it was then that the Gilder Nyman Institute started doing summer institutes for teachers. I did one of the first four at Amherst College in whatever it was, uh, 1995 or six. The first ever was by David Brian Davis at Yale. And then there were 10 and then there were 20 and then there were 30 and 40. And Carolee was in our, I did it with Jim Horton and Lois Horton. And it, God bless them both. They've departed. And Carolee was in that. I don't, you remember the year. I don't. Maybe you don't remember the year. Whatever it was, it was. Oh, well, mine was browner. Anyway, uh, but the point simply is, and then came teaching American history grants, lest we forget. God bless Senator Byrd, whatever else he was notorious for. He, uh, he, he, he pulled Congress into that phenomenon of the teaching American history grants, millions and millions of dollars. That went into bringing teachers together and thousands upon thousands of teachers over this last 20 years, 25 years. I've done summer institutes for 25 years now. I mean, it, it and you know, it's it's why if they if they want to come at somebody, they should come at us. I, I've said that. I said that in a piece in the Atlantic. I said, you know, you, you want to blame, don't blame the teachers, bring it on us. We went out and taught them about slavery and taught them about these issues. Um, so that's the positive side of this. I mean, teachers have at least had access. When I was a high school teacher, if they had these summer institutes, I'd have killed to go to these things and they paid your way for God's sake. Um, so, uh, a motivated teacher does have options now that they didn't always have. If they want to go learn something new and learn something new and go read something, be treated like an intellectual, which is what you are. Um, but we're still, in fact, my first thought on the morning after Trump was elected, I, I don't know why, my first thought was, God, have we failed? All these teacher institutes, all these years of teaching the new history, God, have we failed? You know, and then I kind of got over it in a few days and didn't keep blaming myself or the rest of us. Well, I started blaming my cousins who voted for Trump. Um, Anyway, let's move to the audience for questions. Are, are we using microphones or are we, there we are? Okay, good. Yes, I, I have a I have a question for the panelists, but I'd like to just preface it with something that Cindy talked about and one of my some of my own experiences with with Gary. Um, in the in the nineteen nineties, I taught in the Department of History at UCLA, uh, history of uh, labor and working class movements, and I taught industrial relations in the in the Graduate School of Management. And I got to know Gary pretty well during this period. And I was invited to come in and speak in those summer institutes. I think I did three of them. And it was an ex really 
really an exciting thing to meet all the teachers and come in. But I, but the the last one I did, Gary divided my time into two sessions. One I came at the very beginning, and then I finished up at the very end after the students had been there for I think five days, something like that. The teachers were always really interesting to talk to when I would first go in and talk to them at the beginning of the course. They were very, very interested. They were listening really carefully. They were nodding their heads. They were um, they were engaged in, 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 in listening. And then, but when I noticed when I came back at the end of the five days or whatever days it was to speak to them, they were sort of different. How were they different? Well, they were much more energized. They had a lot more opinions. Things that I was talking about, about labor and about class and about things like that, were things they already seemed to know quite a bit more about. And they were kind of, uh, they, and, and you, could, you could sense that the teachers were becoming advocates for what we had been talking about, or they were, or they were becoming um, uh, 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 people who could, who could go out and, and bring these messages in a certain sense. Uh, but I want, but that was a different period. And I wonder now, what would we expect? What would we anticipate our teachers to be going out to do when they go into their classrooms? Because the classrooms are now like an, an uh, like a battleground, and the public and the public school system is a battleground, and the t and the and the school board meetings are battlegrounds, and the legislation is, and the judicial committee, and there's this you know, election in Wisconsin, et cetera. So I'm wondering what it, what, what would we expect? What would we think the teachers, what message would we give to the teachers at the end of the, of the, uh, of the instruction, given the current situation? Uh, we've got at least three former secondary teachers here, et cetera, et cetera. What, go ahead. Well, one of the things that, um, that I've learned doing this work is that it's um, community by community, right? In, in California, in Southern California. So, um, we always try to uh, listen with like sensitivity and we understand that not only are we what we're going through right now, but like we need to be real about what we all experienced, right? And the trauma that we're all carrying, teachers and students and all of us in here, plus all of these social political things, it's really exhausting our teachers, right? And I mean, like you're seeing it in, you know, the sort of quit, quitting teaching movement that's happening in that conversation. Um, one of the things that Carol Lee mentioned was the FAIR Act. So when we talk to teachers in communities where it's a little scary to teach some of these things, um, we, we try to encourage teachers by one saying you have a state funded, partially state funded organization, the California History Social Science Project, which um, Gary Nash had a major part in its origin, by the way, and I'm at UCLA and it started in 1991. So, you know, you do the math. Um, and coming out and saying that this is the kind of history that needs to be taught. And so we have your back. Then you have a FAIR Act, a law, right? That says that teachers are required to teach more inclusive histories and it names the groups. And then we have content standards. And so we always point them in that direction um, as we're listening with sensitivity. We're not sort of saying, hey, you need to do this. We know you, you work in, for example, Kern County and you have to teach. We have sort of understand that there's safety measures that need to be taken and there's community things that need to be um, considered, but it's still important that our students are learning about these inclusive histories because the one thing that we feel, we always fail to, I feel is a failure in these conversations is that we don't hear from students. We don't, right? Their voices are largely absent in this. I mean, we could hear from them online and sort of get a sense of what they would like to learn, but the students are open and well, from what we're seeing in California, students are open and really interested in learning about this. And you think about this, you, this new generation, right? And sort of how more inclusive they are, um, they're ready. And so part of this is also some like generational stuff that we have to work through as, as teachers and really getting, we really want the teachers to think through what their teaching identity is. And why are you a history teacher? What does that mean in a community level? right, in a sort of statewide level, at a national level, we got to really spend time thinking right now with teachers. And so that looks like for us is just opportunities to meet and chat, right? We will bring in somebody to talk to teachers, but just opportunities for us to chat about our work and about where we are um, has, I found, been helpful with the teachers that we're working with. Carolee? Um, it's, 
It's at, when um, at the NCHE conference, Joanne Freeman asked, I'm, I'm a Joanne Freeman fangirl also, or basically all historian fangirl. Um, but she asked, how can, how can historians help and support teachers? And everything you said, Dr. Blight, just, and, 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 and thank you for your service also. Just being able to learn from historians is amazing. It's an amazing world we live in. I was always afraid of historians. Pro there's probably some unfriendly ones that I met, but you're all friendly. But you never had to be at our department meetings. <laughs> but being able to learn from historians for the, the history that we may not have gotten in our K-12 or even beyond education, um, being able to interact with accessible, friendly historians um, on Twitter. I know Twitter has its problems. But the social the K-12 social studies teachers, we are still existing in community on Twitter, on the edge of Twitter, um, interacting and having Twitter chats and book clubs and supporting each other in DMs and, and sharing sadness, sharing hard things that are happening in states and, and restrictions, but also supporting each, supporting each other in genuine community. Um, in NCSS, we got together in Philadelphia last December, and it was like, it was like history teacher Disneyland, just being together in the space with people who cared about us. And so it's invaluable to, to interact with historians, for historians who mentor us, who, who share history, who are public facing. And, and we know that you've got our back and that back and that is really appreciated. So thank you. Robin, go ahead. Weigh in on this. Um, I just, in February, I just did a workshop, an NEH workshop on teaching Black Lives Matter to uh it was about 45 school teachers and at a time when of course part of the the attack on the ap curriculum was you can't teach black lives matter and i got the exact same experience that you described that is um the teachers knew a lot and they were enthusiastic and they were really trying to think deeply about how to do this they were courageous and I, I want to emphasize the courage because sometimes we forget, I mean, of course, y'all as teachers know this, when have teachers not been under fire um, and under duress, um, not just politically, but economically. And just right now, the recent uh, solidarity strike in, of, of LA teachers and support of, I mean, that was extraordinary. And that's exactly the kind of model of American history in practice that we should be teaching anyway. Because that's that's what that's what the country is and should be, you know that level of solidarity. So I I'm, I think that we have to do more to support teachers, uh, in both in the workshops, but also basic labor protections and standards. Um, you know support financially, you know, so that people don't have to come out of pocket to get basic materials, you know, and also just show up for teachers and recognize that. You know, it's not like it's a lack of knowledge. It really is um, about lack of resources. Orlando, well, I, I don't want, I want our other teacher to have a shot on this one. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do my best to be brief. I've had, you know, post pandemic. I've done well during the pandemic, several workshops online post pandemic. I've done two where you know, and as a national institution, I, I need to go to places I've never gone to before. I had no intention of going to. Um, and as fortune, fate, luck would have it, the first workshop this year that we conducted was in Tennessee, in Franklin, the weekend that Governor Lee signed the no drag shows in public um, legislation, right? And so, to, to your point, the the or to your question, there as in a summer workshop that I did last year, in which we brought up content that folks were unfamiliar with, right? Whether it was um, the connections over time between um, Tulsa, Emmett Till, and the movement for Black Lives, like not like thematically, but actually like kin relationships, right? Um, as well as the work of uh, the dreamers, teachers got excited, but also immediately asked for support. Um, so that is different. Um, and 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 when I mean support, it means like in the way that Secretary Bunch talks about it, which is providing cover. Like 
you know, how, how you all have the institutional heft to do something that we don't, um, one. Two, um, ensuring, you know, as Danny has pointed out, you know, teachers can and are always looking for, for edges, right? Um, to, to, to move and angles to, to see through. And so ensuring that the content is directly aligned to the standards in the skills um, and skills in standards, right? So it's it's not, we're using this story and this content to get at how to cite evidence or how to build arguments so that, you know, we, we make sure that the work that we're doing is sound both at an intellectual and academic level, but that can run the gauntlet of needing to, uh, you know, appease folks who are wedded to standards. We have a question over here, yes ma'am. Yes, my name is Kristen Lee. I'm a proud, one of the proud big sisters of Erica Lee. Um, but I wanted to say, um, Gary Nash was my professor at UCLA when I was an undergrad. I had an outstanding course from him on California history, which I thought was the hardest class I had taken in four years as a history major, but out, just outstanding. And I wanted to give a shout out to the California History Social Science Project. I, I've been a um, public elementary school and middle school teacher since 1989, and luckily in Palo Alto. Um, and I had an amazing, life-changing, four-week paid for, for a teacher, that's just like a miracle, um, session at UCLA. And I learned about Chinese American history for the first time, really, at this four-week session in the summer. But as I'm a middle school uh, librarian right now, it's been a Abs absolutely wonderful job. And I wanted to make sure that everyone who is an educator here knows that your librarians can be your, your partners to help you. Um, we can make live guides for you. We can pull books. And most importantly, we can make sure that in our libraries, our students see mirrors, windows, and sliding doors so they, they can see themselves for the first time sometimes. And I will tell my middle school students, I never saw um, a book in elementary school, middle school, and high school that had a person that looked like me. And so now my job is to make sure that when my kids come into my library, they see all kinds of people. They learn about all kinds of histories. And I urge everyone to make sure that you partner with your librarians. And I'd like to know from the panel if there are some inspirational stories that you've had um, with partnerships with your librarians. Oh, God, I go hug a librarian uh, every chance I get. Uh, well, or say hello to the library. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, can... hey, all love the librarians. Are you kidding? And the curators behind the scenes and every everyone, everybody in between. I've always felt like if, if we knew Armageddon was coming in a week, and it's not, but if it was, let's just all gather in libraries with an open bar and just... Just go down in libraries. That's that's my goal in life. Well, I would. Uh, I'm going to use this opportunity then to shout out a um, librarian that uh, I worked closely with when I was a high school teacher, Jean Chotis. Um, there was this one time where I was a uh, 11th grade AP U.S. history teacher, and this is after the AP exam. You have to cover all that content, and wanted my students to do something meaningful. And I asked them what they wanted to talk about. This is back in 2011, 20. 28, 2008. And it was a war on terror because it was a very veteran heavy community. And there was a lot of family members going off. And so we did teach-ins. I decided let's do teach-ins and we needed books. And this librarian ordered all kinds of books, right? From uh, ghost wars and all these like <laughs> really interesting books that allowed. And then she pulled out excerpts for my, for my students to read. And she was amazing. Whenever there was a teacher that had an idea for a project, Jean was the one that would make it happen. And uh, librarians don't get enough credit for helping teachers kind of execute some of these big ideas that they have. So thank you so much. Over here, Carrie Ann. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Carrie Ann Yakota. I wanted to say how much I enjoyed this panel. So thanks to all of you. I also want to thank um, Cindy uh, for her comments. So I was lucky enough as a graduate student at UCLA to be there right when Gary Nash was fighting the good fight um, at, with the history wars. And I had that model. And Cindy and Gary would invite us to their homes as grad students. And we learned from him, not just through his scholarship, but through his life. 
um, and through his mentorship. And I had that. And I also had um, the mentorship of the community. So coming from the um, Asian American Studies Center at UCLA and working here in Little Tokyo um, with the community as a reporter for the Rafu Shimpo, but also as a community activist. So I had those models. Um, so my question really is about how we can rethink, um, because this is an OAH um, event, I was trying to talk in different panels about how to rethink our profession um, and how we are um, evaluating uh, the people that go into university teaching, for instance. Um, I think that um, I always felt that community um, activism and being in connection and conversation with teachers like Kara Lee, um, I, I think that's important. So when I do teacher um, events, um, I think of um, what you said, Orlando, it's not about me teaching them, it's about learning from them and learning together. So I ask, what can we do as working profession professors? What can we do um, to help your work? And I think it should be part of the graduate school uh, education. And I also think it should be a part of how professors are evaluated in their tenure and promotion cases um, so that community activism and these important political um, activities are counted as intellectual activities because right now it's really about the monograph, not even about co collaborative work, scholarly work and scholarly publications. So I want to start that conversation and I'm, I'm starting it in my own institution thinking about research um, criteria and how we're evaluated, but I wanted to hear from all of you on the panel ideas of how we as um, professors can try to train our grad students to be more aware that this is also part of our work. It's not just about the publication of monographs. Thank you. I'm talking a lot, uh, but Rob, I thought about this. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I think one thing is for the, the discipline at the higher ed, like I get to be here now at UCLA is for history majors to really spend some time looking at the, the documents, the public documents that and in, in sort of guide how history is taught, sort of looking at yourself as a history educator across a K-16 continuum um, and saying, okay, this, this FAIR Act is actually maybe hitting on a level of expertise I have in this framework is talking about stuff that I could talk about. And then maybe linking up with a local district and that history department and saying, I have this level of expert, I can help, I can provide a talk, I could, you know, look at some curriculum you've developed or like work with us, <laughs> you know, we could help do, introduce those things. I think that that would be um, one recommendation F. Um, vertical articulation is an amazing thing, both between K-12 and also up to K-16. Shout out to Dr. Yakota. I'm so excited to see you. Um, she, she, talk about accessible historians. She did a book breaks um, for Gilder Lerman. And like I said before, I used to be scared of historians, but I got over it. Um, and so I emailed her and she responded back. Um, <laughs> representation matters. I'll, if, I'll just say it really quickly. Um, I never saw myself in history. I, I don't recall ever learning any Asian American history. Um, and so, but I always loved history, but it was more as a spectator. And when I went to Gilder Lerman in 2018, and I learned from Dr. Jane Hong, it was the first time, and not that I hadn't had Asian American scholars, but this is the first time that one connected with me. And I was able to learn in a better, deeper way than I had ever before. And so, I don't know if I just kind of forced her to be my friend or something, or um, she became my mentor. And greatly informed how I saw life and how I understood. And because I saw, got that representation, I just kind of got out of control emailing professors and being friendly. Um, and it's worked really well for me because I met Joanne Freeman last week. <laughs> but, but being accessible, mentoring teachers, K-12 teachers, coming into our classrooms, offering webinar support, um, even grad students, mentoring your grad students to be friends to the K-12 teachers is an amazing thing. There's sometimes there's this arrogance, even between, even in K-12 education, like middle school teachers look down at elementary school teachers and say, oh, they never teach history. And then uh, high school teachers look down at middle school teachers and like, oh, you taught Lewis and Clark this year. Great. Um, but if we could just work together, um, I think it would be an amazing thing. Thank you. 
uh, you know, you you kind of answered the question, all the things that you laid out, I mean, I completely agree with. And I happen to be at UCLA where, uh, you know, this is the epicenter of that those kinds of relationships because of this institution that Gary created. But it's not like, you know, that work, and, and of course, you know, Carla, our chair in history knows this, it's not like that work is being, um, well, former chair, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, but I know, yeah, I know you, I, I, I feel you. Um, but it's not as if that work is funded. You know, we, we, we do these capital campaigns all the time. So you say make so much money, but it's not like that work is funded. You know, so I think that's important. And the second thing I want to say is that, you know, I come out of, of Black Studies and African American History, and one of the oldest organizations is the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. When it was formed, at these annual conferences, it was always formed for librarians, for public school teachers, and college teachers. In fact, the college teachers, the college professors, were not a big part of it. It was always the mix. And so it has been like that. It's slightly less now, but it still continues to be that. And that becomes the space for these kinds of interactions, you know, because the 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 you know the the flip side of it is that the nature of Jim Crow is that a lot of people get thrown together, and education becomes community based across these lines of K through twelve to college, and so ironically that created a kind of community that was really unique, um, and you know, so I'll stop there. Well, I mean, I just add to the, and you know this, Karyana, within university departments, this is not highly valued. I mean, uh, when we evaluate our colleagues, et cetera, et cetera. But most people who get engaged with students, I'm, I'm sorry, with teachers, forgive me, and do these summer institutes and do these workshops, love it. Now, it's very hard to do it when you're not tenured. Because you always worry, I'm not, I should be working on my book. I should be working on my book. Well, I should be working on a book right now, too, because I have a deadline in June. But I'd rather do this any day. Uh, but but working, and I can get you one example. For, well, I don't know what it was, 12 years, we had TAH grants and all kinds of grants that we would bring in a, a historian, some of the very best in the Northeast, to meet with teachers like one day a month at 4 o'clock with pizza. Pizza and beer. We'd pay him 500 bucks or something. No one ever turned us down because it's so much fun. Even when teachers are exhausted at five o'clock in the afternoon and you'd rather go get a nap. Um, but, and frankly, back to the question about those summer institutes, which, which Gary started out here, it, it could be the most fun I've ever had teaching. Well, you know, there's always ringers in the group who want to, dominate and whatever but that's true of any group but my god are they motivated right you, you choose to come it's not like history 101 where they may not choose to come uh and there's just nothing quite like the motivation of 25 teachers in a room suddenly away from their families and their homes and all their other problems and just being treated like intellectuals and then taking them to the archive and I've seen so many teachers touch original documents for the first time in their lives. And it's, it, it, and they go into tears when they hold a, a Frederick Douglass letter in their hands or whatever. Uh, and then they all want copies of it. And, you know, and then you have to fight with the library to get the copies made. But uh, it's, it's really been a triumph of this relationship of academia to secondary teaching and even elementary teaching. And there's always a librarian or two in every institute, which I love. There should probably be more. Um, can we take one more question? How's our timing? Or we could take one more? What, where do, there we go, right there. Okay. okay. Yes. Right here. Uh, right. Oh, up here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. From these yeah. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Connor Williams. I'm a former high school teacher, historian, public historian. And I'm one thing I'm struck by the nationwide conversation about what's happening in the classroom, how these laws impact it, is that I kind of feel like in all our collective imaginations, we're seeing AP US history classrooms at the top tier schools and that, and that we have to have those conversations. And my experience as a teacher, I taught in rural Vermont, um, very blue state, but a very red part of the state and students 
hunted for their families and whether they killed that deer actually meant their grocery bill was saved that that month so um and my my sense just from being a teacher was that there was never enough time to even come close to covering all of american history in what they gave me to do and so my my job was to ethically model scholarship to teach them what i could about race and slavery they're never going to get to read charles sumner or thaddeus stevens um but to also show them that scholarship, whatever your political viewpoint, was a fun thing you could do if you had evidence. I had students who I disagreed with dramatically during the election of 2012. But my point was ever to say, you're wrong. It was to say, if you want to make this case, here's how you ethically and responsibly do it with evidence. And so I guess my, my question is that as we talk about what you can and can't say in a classroom to students, and I think Carly mentioned this a little bit, do we miss something by not talking about what it is that teachers really do most of the time in the classroom, what we should hope a good teaching looks like and what we should hope our students come out of our classroom with, which is not the knowledge of the history I've been grateful to gain after 35 years of schooling, still in grad school, but uh, but maybe a, a better understanding of this empathy in the past. And, and can that still be taught without saying gay? So thank you. Comments, reactions? Anyone? I, I, I've been talking too much, but you know, I'm an old person. <laughs> so I, I don't have any time left. Um, so let me, let, this is a great question. You're still younger than me, Robert, Robert. come on. Not, not, that, not by that much. Um, but there's two elements to your question. One was, I, I don't know if you intended to do this, but a uh, kind of a critique of AP, which I actually think, because a lot of times we talk about advanced placement and it, takes the place of history teaching. And of course, all the teachers know that advanced placement is just a tiny part of it. Um, and you know, and part of what the college board does, it's make, it makes its money. That's why they're willing to compromise. They don't, they don't compromise because you know, they're ideologically you know, aligned with DeSantis. They compromise because they stand to lose a lot of money. But there's a t another part of the AP process that is, although I'm critical of it, and I just wish that we can get rid of it because I have all these students that come to my, I teach US history. Uh, and they come to my class and say, well, I learned all this before. I said, no, you didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, you know, my, my, first, my first lecture for the second half of the US history course is capitalism won the civil war. I said, did you learn that in AP? You know, and like, well, no, you know. So AP doesn't really advance students, but what it does do, is for working class students who are able to transfer those credits, it could save them money, depending on what school they go to. That's, that's the one benefit of it. But other than that, I'd blow it up um, altogether. You know, but in terms of the other part of the question, um, what we can tell them, and, and here I'm gonna get myself in trouble, but I'm an old person. Um, I don't, I think empathy is a dangerous thing. And let me explain why. Just like I think, um, well, the reason I think empathy is a dangerous thing is because empathy is about identifying with, with people's groups, someone who is something like you, because your point of, of entry is like, I recognize that. What we have to do is teach people to recognize them in their context and time, rather than say, oh, I identify with that person, so that we can we can see even the people we don't like as actors. So part of the identity issue around the way we teach history is that we want to identify with someone who's like us. I, that's okay, I'm not against that at all. But what we also want to do is be able to understand struggles that are not anything like us. That's the hardest and the most important thing. And that opens up, that's why whenever people say, oh, I don't want people to feel, um, uncomfortable, that white students feel uncomfortable. I've never met a white student that felt uncomfortable about learning about racism. I just haven't. I've heard, I've had racist white students, but that's different. You know, in other words, it's not like, oh God, I feel like that's me, um, because it's not them. And just like when I open up my classes, I say like, first of all, first day of class, how many of you have been an actual slave? Raise your hand, nobody. How many of you own slaves? No one, right? Now, of course, one day it's gonna happen, but 
the fact that they have, I said, so now we're beginning together at the same place. We are learning about a time, place, condition, relationships that we actually don't know anything about. So don't claim that you know because you're, you're a descendant of a slave. You know, don't claim you know because you're a descendant of, of someone else. We've got to enter into this in time, place, condition. And that opens up conversations that are, that are, not, that are not really uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable if we identify with people. Then if we disidentify and try to understand people in their time, they become less uncomfortable in one way, but more uncomfortable in a different way. And that is trying to understand things that are really hard to understand. And that's, that's how I see it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I've been thinking about teaching and schools a lot. Um, and I, I brought Bell Hooks into the room because she's why I entered the classroom. In, in many regards. And now I'm gonna bring in, like thinking through um, Sylvia Winter and Catherine McKittrick and like mis the logical fallacy at a po political scale that is mistaking the map for the territory, right? So, and what I mean by that and what, you know, I want us to, what I think about is, you know, this thing we call the classroom, right, um, is something that we should think about a lot more than we do, and we fight over it, but we're talking about the map, right, when we're talking about curriculum, when we're talking about standards, but the territory, what is supposed to be going on, what we know about that place or the possibilities therein, we aren't as familiar with. We have lost track of what that is, I, you know, in many regards because we're focusing on the map and getting the map right. Um, and so I think that this has been a long struggle and a long fight uh, in schools relentlessly. And I appreciate, you know, when we were all together in November, um, Professor Jeffries remind us again, like the civil rights movement and um, the, the, the suit brought forward was not about integration. Right, but we have again lost the map for the territory there as well. It was about equity, you know, and as he, there, there's you know, so we, we need to understand this a little bit more deeply. And I appreciate your question because, you know, again, if we if we if we imagine schools and classrooms as places to craft workers, it's doing that, it's working just fine. But if we imagine this place and I'm a geographer so place matters deeply right um as a portal as a place that can serve as a pivot to the past present and future if we learn how to make meaning together based on the stories that are in the room that's a very different read of what teaching is I think that's we've run show. our course of time which is a shame uh, uh we all have more questions and more to say I'm sure but uh, please join me in thanking the panel, if you would. And I gladly turn it over to my colleague, Andy. Well, and please join me in, in thanking David and the panel again. And, and Lynn, I would love to know more. And I do actually know more. And I'd love all of you to, of course, go explore Janum. Your, your uh, green dot gets you uh, into that incredibly powerful, poignant uh, history classroom that museums are when they're at their best and your leadership and guidance of that. And I wish I'd love to ask you some more questions, but we have a reception to go to as well. And um, before we do, I have the deep honor of asking Carla Pastana, professor and Joyce Appleby chair uh, in America in the world at UCLA, uh, who dives deeply uh, into 17th and 18th histories, especially of the Atlantic and the Caribbean to say a few words to close this out. Thank you, Anthea, for inviting me and for hosting this event. I don't mean to stand in front of my colleague, Robin. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I would like to, to say that I think it's really important that we get together and have these conversations. But I would like to step back even from that and say that it's really imp important to have organizations like the OAH, because we need, as historians, as intellectuals, we need advocacy. We need someone to, to speak up for what we do and why it's important to represent us in court cases, to do that work of, you know, saying this is what scholarship is. 
this is why it matters. This is how to, you know, to use it in our society to make it a, a more just and equitable place. So I'm really happy to be here as part of this event uh, sponsored by the OAH. Uh, just for a few words uh, to bring it to a close, I'll say that I was a Gary Nash graduate student at UCLA. Um, I was there in the 80s, so I was already at my first job when he was fighting the fight for uh, the history standards and for history education. And I watched that closely from my perch in Ohio, uh, where I was then teaching. Um, I just like to say two things about Gary to bring this to a close. One is to think about him as a person who saw service uh, in the broadest sense as really an important part of what he did. He thought uh, the work he did in the schools and with teachers was the most important, one of the most important things that he did over the course of a long career that included many awards, many books, many articles, many students whom he taught. He thought the work he did with the teachers was incredibly important and it inspired him. He felt like it was very important and it energized him. And I, I worked with him in a few of his teaching, you know, American history and other of the funding uh, opportunities that he had to bring in people to talk to teachers. And I saw them working with Gary and I saw their, not only their admiration, but also their gratitude. They felt like he was not patronizing them. He did not think he was the expert and they were there as his students. He thought of it in terms of teamwork, in terms of facilitating. And they recognized that way of engaging with him that was really gratifying to them and important to them. And I think that that's an important model for us to take away. The other thing is, I think, important to think about is Gary's optimism. He put up with so much trash and so many challenges and so much criticism, and he never lost heart for very long. He always felt like the work that was that we were all doing together was really important and that it made a difference and that it could make a difference. And I hope we can leave here feeling some of that, some of that sense that in spite of all the difficulties, um, all the challenges that teachers face, that people that want to support teachers face, that it really matters that we do this work and that we not lose heart. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Carla. And thank you again to Carla and one of Gary's uh, amazing students and my mentor, Sharon Salinger, for cooking up this idea over a Zoom conversation, I think. Um, so it's beautiful to see it come to fruition. And thank you again to incredible panelists, uh, to the Japanese American National Museum, to our dear colleagues at UCLA, and to the Organization of American Historians. So please stay in our beloved community in the reception. Thank you.